people today. So these are my disclosures. Oops, going quickly. So again, we're all here because we know heart disease is the number one killer of Americans. It continues to be. There's lots of reasons for this. Um, some of these reasons we have control over, and some of them we have less control. Genetics certainly play a role. Today, uh, when you get a lipidologist as a speaker, you're going to hear about lipids and lipoproteins from me, but I certainly recognize that multiple parameters, inflammation, diet, and all of the things that we see here play a significant role in the disease uh, that pre presents phenotypically. So we all want to make sure we're on the same page, which again, in this audience, I think we are. I think we all probably believe and buy into the fact that LDL particles drive atherosclerosis. There's certainly many other parameters that, that play a role in this, and when LDL particles become oxidized, there's a whole cascade of events that leads to plaque formation. But ultimately, it's the particles that drive the disease. The more particles you have, the more disease we see. And multiple clinical trials have shown this. When I show this slide to audiences that are less familiar with advanced testing, they think I'm a bit nuts when I say, you know, LDL cholesterol is actually not LDL. I don't know what I'm talking about. LDL is obviously a particle. So cholesterol and triglycerides are fats, they're oils. They're made in the liver and we need them. We need them for cell membranes, for hormones, for so many actions in our body. But to get from the liver that's making them to the organs that need them, they somehow have to be carried because fats are not going to be soluble in plasma. So they get carried in these particles that have lipoproteins surrounding them and allow them to be soluble in plasma. Every atherogenic particle in our body has a label on it. It's got an ApoB label. So ApoB is one way to really measure this atherogenic particle burden. So that being an LDL particle, if you see here on the bottom, this is what LDL cholesterol is. And it's certainly extremely variable from patient to patient. And certainly, LDL particle concentration and or ApoB is not the same thing as the LDL cholesterol content of the particles. We recognize there's tremendous amount of heterogeneity between particles. They're small, they're medium, they're large. Some particles are half full of cholesterol and some are absolutely engorged. And just knowing how much cholesterol your particles are carrying does not tell us anything about what the particle burden is. So if we gather up all your LDL particles and we just measure what's in there, we don't really know anything. And this next slide illustrates that. So if half of this room, if you all have LDL cholesterols of 100, I'm assuming in this group that wouldn't convince you that you're home free, right? You want to know more than that. Assuming none of you have had a heart attack uh, or a stroke and would be in a higher risk category, normally an LDL cholesterol, according to guidelines, is optimal. Obviously, if the vehicles that are carrying your cholesterol are smaller, you need more to carry it, right? Makes sense. So that's a no-brainer. So if you've got small particles, you have more present in order to carry the same amount of cholesterol. And if you believe in the statement I made that LDL particles drive atherosclerosis, we know if they're small and you have too many, you're at higher risk. But I think one of the things that gets very confusing when it comes to advanced testing, we group it all into one big box and there's a lot of different tests and they're not all the same is that even if you have large particles, you've got fluffy, buoyant, big, good guys. If you have too many of them, you're still at risk. It's the particle number that matters, the ApoB that matters, not uh, whether they're big or small as far as predicting risk. Now, I'm not saying that particle size doesn't play a role because it absolutely does in what we decide to use clinically to treat patients. But it doesn't predict risk. And if you tell me you have small particles and tell me nothing about how many there are, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know to tell you if you're at risk or not. So this is illustrating two patients both with large particles. How could it be that one has more risk than the other? Well, one patient has particles that are large, but they're only half full. And so therefore, you need more. This is actually what happens when you put people on statins. The particle number decreases, but also the cholesterol content of the particle decreases. So you have now cholesterol depleted particles, but uh, oftentimes with statin monotherapy, you haven't actually achieved optimal particle reduction. Okay, there's lots of evidence. Normally I have to spend a lot of time convincing people of this. I'm actually gonna skip over it because again, uh, I think you guys are all on the same page I am. Uh, one thing I just wanna mention, uh, because ApoB and LDL particles are, obviously they're different measurements. Why can they basically be pretty well interchanged? 
at any one point in time in our body, about 90% of the ApoB is being carried on LDL particles. So generally, those markers are pretty interchangeable with each other. There are certain disease states where that is not the case. It's important to know that, but realize you probably won't see a lot of these people. Type 3 dyslipoproteinemia, which is a remnant disease, is something I see in a lipid clinic, but you may not see quite as often in clinical practice. Those patients phenotypically have very high triglycerides in the 400 range. LDL is also in the 3-400 range. If you do an ApoE genotype, they'll be E2, E2. They will have a discrepancy between ApoB and LDLP as a result of the fact they have a lot of remnant particles. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a few slides here. This is looking at the Framingham offspring, and I'll just briefly go over this. Uh, when we look at how well LDL cholesterol predicts event-free survival, obviously we want to be the ones that are not having events. We want our mother and father and brother and sister and everyone we know to be event-free. So if you look at Framingham, you see that LDL cholesterols that are low predicted a lower event rate, and that's certainly not debatable. In the same study, however, there's additional data where there were a subset of patients that had high LDL cholesterols that actually do awesome. They're in their 90s and they're not having an event, so what's going on here? There's also a subset of patients that have low LDL cholesterols, actually the lowest in the study, and they were the ones that had the greatest event rate. So we need to try to sort out what's going on. Now, Framingham looked at cholesterol as a measurement of LDL, but if we all agree that that's really actually a very poor way to measure LDL burden, if instead we use NMRs to measure the actual particle number, we find that what was predictive of event-free survival was having a low LDL particle number. So, and again, this was measured with NMR technology. And those patients that had the greatest event rate were those that had low LDL cholesterol and high particles. And a lot of them are running around out there, and a lot of doctors have no idea that those patients are at risk because most doctors are not like you in doing advanced testing more routinely. LDL particles twice as strongly predictive of risk. Now, Framingham, people have issues with Framingham. It's a lot of white people in Massachusetts, and that's not representative of the United States of America. So MESA is another epidemiologic trial that encompasses a lot more ethnic diversity, and men and women are both included in this, style, in this trial. Um, these patients were followed prospectively. They were event-free. At the beginning of the trial, they were followed with CIMT analysis as well as biomarkers to track what, what tracks with event rates over time. And this is just a summary of that data. And what you can see is when LDL particles and LDL cholesterol are discordant, meaning they disagree, they're in two different directions, what tracks with risk and what tracks with event rate is the particle number, not the cholesterol. So as you can see, the greatest event rate here, that's the red line, are the patients with the LDL particles that are elevated despite the fact the LDL cholesterol is low. Now, there's another group of patients here that we don't always talk about, and these are the patients that have low particles but high cholesterol. And the question is, you know, do we need to be treating these patients? You know, I'm not a believer that everybody in this world that has high cholesterol needs to be on statin therapy. And certainly not every child or young person or primary prevention needs to be. However, I'm an aggressive lipidologist and I'm aggressive as far as prevention. And if you've got abnormal numbers and you're young and you've got very significant particle elevations, that's a different story. But how do I figure out who to treat and who not to treat? Which children to commit to drugs and which not? You certainly want to minimize drug therapy as much as possible. So if you look at the carotid IMT data in MESA, what you see is in the patients, again, with optimal LDL cholesterols, what, again, is associated with an elevated IMT score is having the highest quartile of particle number. So also LDL particles, again, this is measured by NMR technology, uh, is associated with subclinical disease as measured by CIMT. So who are the people that we need to measure? My bias is everybody. I think we should be doing advanced testing in everybody. This should replace our lipid panel. That's my bias. If you don't want to do that, then you need to start selecting patients. And I think the patients that deserve at least a, a couple times in their lives to have an evaluation certainly would be patients with existing cardiovascular disease. Anybody who's had a family history deserves it and probably deserves a lot more than an NMR. They should get inflammatory markers. Anything else you can order because it's helpful to be able to identify risk early. This disease is largely preventable, but we can't prevent it if we don't know that you're on that path. It's great when you have a family history, but if a family history doesn't exist, it doesn't help you. And when I see children, the family history doesn't help me because the parents are my age or usually 20 years younger than me, which is getting more disturbing over time. I realized the other day when I was seeing a patient that this was my staff member's father. And I was taking care of him, and, and I kind of kept looking at the age, thinking, your father is my age. <laughs> this patient works for me. Ay, ay, ay. Can't control that part of it, I guess. All right. 
So high triglycerides, low HDL, also associated with uh, usually disconnects between LDL particles and LDL cholesterol. You've seen this slide a couple times. I'm not going to belabor the issue. Just point out that there is the ADA, the ACC came out and said, look, LDL cholesterol is not good enough. You darn well better be doing non-HDL, and you should be thinking about an ApoB or an NMR, both of which were very strongly promoted in this paper. Uh, if you haven't read it, you certainly should. I, I do question the ApoB levels that they published. I'm not sure where they came up with those numbers um, because they're, they're very conservative. If you look at where we put patients for LDL cholesterol as far as in, the, in percentile equivalents, looking at Framingham and the MESA epidemiologic database, when we have a very high risk patient, we want their LDL cholesterol under 70, which puts them in the less than 50 percent or the, less than 5th percent of the population. Um, it, with NMR particles, that means in the 700 to 800 range of LDL particle concentration, and ApoB be under 60 would be more appropriate for somebody very high risk, and that would be my target uh, for ApoB in the very high risk patients, under 80 in the lower risk patients. One way to remember uh, NMR goals under 1,000 is pretty much optimal for everybody, unless you have a very high risk patient, then you might want to target it down to 700. If you have other things, MPO, LP little a's, other things that are flagging you as higher risk, those are patients I may also put in that uh, closer to 700 category. Okay, first clinical application. Uh, this is actually a woman who's in her 40s, who's had a high LDL, but she has done just about everything she possibly can to control this with diet and exercise. She exercises 150 minutes a week. She has an excellent diet, um, close to a vegetarian diet, um, very healthy. She's not overweight. She's got thyroid disease that is stable. If she had thyroid disease that was not treated, that could raise her lipids. You always want to make sure you're addressing that as a secondary cause. There's no family history of heart disease in this woman. So I want more information. Obviously, I want to decide what am I supposed to do with this person? Should I be putting her on therapy because her LDL is 170? Well, if you believe that LDL particles are a better marker of risk, uh, in this case, her particles are 1,200 which is, is very close to optimal in somebody that's low risk and doesn't have other concerning factors. Under 1,000 is perfect. Under 1,300 is certainly reasonable in a low risk patient. She has next to no small dense LDL, but again, her LDL cholesterol is elevated. So the question is, what do we do with these people? And according to guidelines, we're supposed to do something. We're supposed to actually treat her, according to the American Heart Association 2011 update for women. I would argue that even in my aggressive lipid practice, I would elect to send her home and let her keep doing what she's doing and not put her on additional therapy. There's nothing here that's flagging her as being at risk. We might do additional tests. Again, Cleveland Heart Lab offers so many different options. You may want to just do a one-time full panel, but again, you can feel pretty reassured. If you look again at where she falls, her LDL cholesterol is putting her in the greater than 80th percentile of the population. However, her LDL particles, which are better marker of risk, put her in the less than 20th percentile of the population, which is certainly a reasonable place to be. Okay, that's primary prevention example. I'm going to show you another one in a little bit. Let's move to secondary prevention. What I'm trying to do is sort of set the stage for different clinical scenarios and how advanced testing can help us make good clinical decisions. So these are two patients, real patients, that came to me on the same day earlier this year. They both had recently had a myocardial infarction. Their cardiologist recently put them on statin therapy. Both of them were on moderate dose statins when they came to see me. So. This is the data that I was initially given. As you can see, their body mass index is 29, a little bit overweight in Wisconsin. That is perfectly optimal. We're very happy when we're under 30. Seriously, I, I'm not too concerned about their weight, but obviously there's some room to move there. Again, if you look at their lipids, total cholesterol, I mean 140, 120, LDL's under 70. Can't argue with that, right? HDL's over 40 for men. According to all the recommendations, that's perfectly optimal. The triglycerides are slightly different now, an 81 and a 152. How many of you would initiate a, second, a, new, a medication for a triglyceride of 152 off the bat? Some of you might. You're aggressive with trigs. Okay. Uh, most doctors probably wouldn't, um, and they probably would incorporate some sort of lifestyle therapy first as an option, but it, it's certainly reasonable. Now, these two people just had, they have existing cardiovascular disease. So some would say, I get very aggressive with all my cardiac patients. I put them all in combination drug therapy. There's nothing wrong with that, but they probably don't all need it. Uh, so in this case, I want to be able to make a good decision. Non-HDL here was optimal. Non-HDL may be a poor man's particle number or ApoB, but you're going to miss some people along the way. It's certainly not perfect. So the LDL particle here in patient one is, is elevated. It's 1,800. We want it under 700. This guy's got 1,000 points too many. 
This is somebody that if I'm going to add another agent, this is probably the patient I'm going to add another agent to uh, just because of the fact he's got uh, such significant disease. And that other agent doesn't have to be a drug. That other agent could be some sort of lifestyle or diet intervention as well. In secondary prevention, I'm a little bit more aggressive with drug therapy than in primary prevention. Second patient has an LDL particle number of 1,000. So again, two people coming in looking very, very similar in their traditional lipids, and how do you make a decision about whether we treat or not treat? Obviously, we have to do something more with patient number one, whereas the second patient probably, uh, even if you want to get it down to 700, that can very easily be done with lifestyle. A thousand point drop could happen with lifestyle if it's dramatic. Uh, if it's somebody that really has a lot of room to move there, it could happen. But in secondary prevention, again, adding a secondary agent is probably what you're going to need to do to address the particles. Okay, so if we find a discrepancy, we've got a patient on a drug, they come in, their LDLP or ApoB is high, now what are we supposed to do? What do we pick next? I can tell you if you double the dose of the statin, good luck. Next time they come back, you're not going to see a whole lot of change in the particles. You might see LDL cholesterol drop a little bit, but as I explained earlier, what happens with statins is the initial drop in LDL particles in ApoB occur with that first dose. When you double the dose, you may get a 6% reduction of LDL cholesterol. You get peanuts for particle reduction. You just don't get much at all. And I can tell you from having seen thousands of patients over the years, I've been doing NMRs since 1999. Uh, almost exclusively as a replacement of my lipid panel, so I truly have seen thousands of patients. Many patients on high-dose monotherapy statin have elevated particle numbers, especially secondary prevention. Okay, so statins, azetamide, both lower particles, but again, you sort of get the bang for the buck initially, and then there's not usually much beyond that that you'll achieve. When you look at diets, actually low-fat diets lower LDL cholesterol, but they're not as effective at lowering LDL particles. When you look at low-carb diets, they're more effective at getting particles down and getting small, dense LDL um, to, to begin to resolve itself. When you look at the things that actually are more effective at lowering particles, especially in combination with agents like statins, if you need to use combination therapy, those would be agents like niacin, fibrates, pioglitazone, metformin, not on the list, but certainly appropriate, omega-3s, exercise, again, low-carb diet, and actually dietary interventions and lifestyle changes have more of an impact on particles than they do on cholesterol, and I'm going to show you some cases with that. One way to remember the agents that are going to be more likely to lower particle number are basically everything on this list essentially treats triglycerides and HDL, right? So if you think about what type of agents we bring on board to address a high triglyceride, low HDL, it's basically anything up here will have an effect on that parameter and also has an effect on particle reduction. Please, please do not stop using niacin because of AIM High. We don't have time to go into that. If it, want, if it wants to come up in the panel discussion, I'd love to give you my two cents worth on that, but it's just extremely disturbing to me that we're seeing cardiology groups stopping niacin in all their patients. They'll have more business, I guess, maybe. Maybe that's what they're shooting for. I don't know. Uh, I just want to show you here that when you use statin monotherapy, you get a 25 to 35% reduction. Now, Jupiter did better. Jupiter got a 45, 50% reduction. But generally, that's what we see in statin monotherapy. When you look at combination therapy trials, while well, these are small, smaller studies, the N is smaller, you still see much more substantial reduction in events. Um, 60 to 70% events are still occurring in these patients on, on statins. So, is LDL cholesterol lowering enough? Obviously, a lot of events still occur when all we focus on is LDL cholesterol. Those doctors who do HDL and triglycerides and are aggressive are doing a lot better job, even if you're not doing advanced testing, but certainly there's more to be done here. The thing is, LDL cholesterol lowering, actually, this may be enough in a perfect world. I wish I lived in a perfect world, but that is not where I live. This is where I live. This is Wisconsin. This is actually the world. And we can blame it on our parents, and I think that's the best thing to do, because then we don't have to take any responsibility, um, especially if they're not alive anymore. It's even better yet. Then nobody feels bad. But you know, people blame it on their genes, and obviously genetics play a big role here. But we play a role, too. And we need to be able to address the role we play. You've seen this slide a couple times. Obesity very closely behind this epidemic of obesity is an epidemic of diabetes, and this is a true crisis. And it's a crisis because it doesn't only affect the United States and affluent countries. This is affecting the world. Poor, impoverished countries are having an increase in prevalence of diabetes. And if we move forward 20 years, I'm going to show you what this graph looks like 20 years from now. I mean, this is a public health 
crisis. And unfortunately, again, it's not just in affluent nations, it's in poor countries. And unfortunately, it's not adults. It's also children. This picture was not taken in America. People say, you live in Japan, you come to America, you get fat because you eat like we do. This was taken in Japan, Japanese children, and this picture was taken in China. This is truly a worldwide epidemic. It is our job as, as physicians interested in prevention to do something about this. These diseases are preventable. Heart disease and diabetes are preventable. As long as we identify who it is that's on that path and we get aggressive with doing what we need to do up front when they're as young as we can possibly get them, that's going to make a big difference. So I want to talk next uh, about advanced testing beyond LDLP and ApoB. And we're going to come back to that in a couple other cases. But I think you probably all get the fact that particles are better measures, ApoB is a better measure. If we really want to make good decisions, we need to make sure that we've optimized their goal. But what bothers me is we focus too much on this, and we miss the fact that advanced lipoprotein testing, and I'm going to show you uh, NMR analysis here, has a window into something else that we don't pay enough attention to, and we should, because it really impacts clinical decision making. When we look at, again, this epidemic of obesity and diabetes and prediabetes and metabolic syndrome, as you, you all know the criteria for this. I don't need to go over it with you. But what's missing from metabolic syndrome criteria is anything mentioning LDL, right? It's triglycerides and HDL. And why is that? Well, because LDL cholesterol is not predictive of anything in metabolic syndrome. What happens, though, is that as triglycerides go over 100, you begin to create small, dense LDL, and you begin to have a significant disconnect between your particles and your LDL cholesterol. Same thing when HDL goes down. So some people would also say, well, triglycerides and HDLs are really kind of another way, a poor man's way to do advanced testing. I can tell you there's a lot of people out there with normal trigs and normal HDL who have abnormal LDLP, abnormal ApoB. It's not good enough, but it's certainly a, a good starting point. So again, you look at metabolic syndrome, LDL cholesterol, whether you've got none of the criteria or whether you have everything. You've got high blood pressure, glucose, lipid disturbances, and abdominal weight gain doesn't shift. But if you look instead at measuring LDL as measuring cholesterol, you actually look at the particles. What you see, the, the orange here is the small dense LDL, and the blue is the large. What happens is as you have more criteria for metabolic syndrome, you begin to shift from making larger particles to the small dense LDL, which have properties about them that are, are atherogenic and, and highly problematic in the body. Patients with diabetes are the ones most likely to be seeing the significant disconnect. If you look at your patients with diabetes, this is from Framingham with LDLs under 100. Um, many of them have significantly elevated particles. If you say, well, I get everyone to under 70, I'm not in that 20% of docs that get to goal, I get my patients to 100% LDL goal. Well, guess what? 41% of the time, you're still not there. So if you think that LDL cholesterol is sufficient when it's under 70, you're dead wrong. And I guarantee you, if that's the way you're treating patients, there's going to be diabetic patients on statins coming back to you with angioplasties, MIs, and hopefully not death. OK, so this window I'm talking about, this magical window into insulin resistance happens in the lipoproteins, and it happens first. And it happens years before we see the shift in the glucose, in the A1C, in the things we measure traditionally to address insulin resistance. There's characteristics to particles. This is from the Insulin Resistance Atherosclerosis Society. This is from the Women's Health Study, and the characteristics are the same. So small dense LDL, a surplus of large VLDL particles, a lack of large HDL particles are all associated and correlated with insulin resistance and these particles tell us a story, and we need to pay attention to that story. So my opinion, I've been, again, I've been doing this for many, many years, and I was doing it back when nobody was really paying attention to the insulin-resistant information on advanced testing. In fact, the NMR lipo profile just in the last uh, couple years uh, came up with this insulin resistance score. So if you guys are doing NMRs, and I know that's through the Cleveland Heart Lab, you guys get those. If the, particle, if the L LPIR score is over 45, that's your window into insulin resistance. Now, if you re remember what direction all the particles go in, you can just figure that out without having the score. But the score simplifies it. And I'm hoping for the general population out there makes it a lot easier. Years ago, I was paying attention to this information, but I was doing because I knew what direction things shifted in and coming up with decisions. But now it's a little bit simpler. But if we can diagnose diabetes 10 to 15 years before it's there, that's magic. I mean, that's where prevention can really happen. Unfortunately, another pet peeve of mine is how we diagnose diabetes. How many of you think, I mean, diagnosing diabetes with a glucose makes any sense whatsoever? I mean, once you have diabetes, I get it. 
I get that glucose is a way to measure and monitor and make sure you're at goal. And if you've got glucose toxicity, we're doing everything we can to reverse that and address endothelial dysfunction. But to diagnose it with a glucose, by the time you have the diagnosis, you're 10 to 15 years into the problem. And guess what? 50 to 70% of your beta cells are kaput. It, it, they're, they don't work anymore once you've diagnosed diabetes. Well, you know what? Guess what? Drugs don't work very well either at that stage when you've only got 20 to 30% of your beta cells still functioning. And in my understanding, from what, from what I know from everything I've read and, and certainly understand, lots of conferences myself too, is that it's very difficult to actually regenerate beta cells. I'm not saying you can't control diabetes without drugs, but you're not getting back the beta cells that are gone. You're just functioning with the ones that are left. And I can tell you from a lot of clinical experience over the years that the drugs that we use for diabetes, when used earlier, have a whole lot more impact when you've still got a functioning pancreas. So think about that. That's really critical when you think about treating lipids. Again, this is showing you how lipoprotein changes occur many years before you see shifts in glucose. Insulin resistance occurs years before we sh see shifts in glucose. IGT is a better marker than infast impaired fasting glucose because it does pop its ugly head faster. Unfortunately, that also takes years to be abnormal, and by the, by the time you have an abnormal IGT, you're still years into the disease already. So we need to try to do something earlier. So if we're gonna do something earlier, what do we have available to us? Well, there are no FDA-approved medications for prediabetes. However, there are so much data out there regarding safety of several of these medications. Actually, TZDs, metformin, uh, acarbos has also been studied, uh, that the ADA guidelines do recommend use of metformin in the prediabetic patient that has risk. And there's lots of data to back you up. Metformin is obviously used in patients, for example, with PCOS. It's standard of care for them. Who are these people? These are people with insulin resistance that have reproductive consequences. So all PCOS is really at the core of it is insulin resistance and standard of care is metformin. So if we look at data for metformin as, cardi as far as cardiovascular data, we actually have cardiovascular mortality data with metformin. We have more data with metformin than we do with some of the lipid drugs that we prescribe. So we know that, and this is both uh, early studies as well as follow-up studies, that uh, metformin has benefit on the heart. And when you look at a meta-analysis of, uh, these are 40 randomized controlled trials, this was looked at, 26% relative risk reduction in cardiovascular mortality with metformin compared to other drugs. And it's dirt cheap, and I know in some of your states it's actually free. So we cannot be forgetting about, talk about a public health impact. If we can identify patients with insulin resistance earlier and we use lipoproteins as our window, we're gonna have a huge impact on controlling this disease. Okay, so let's look at another case here. This is another 45-year-old woman, and remember the first one. She had an LDL of 170, and she actually had pretty low risk, so we elected to do nothing. This patient's actually quite similar in that she's really optimized her diet. She's optimized her lifestyle changes. She really, it's hard for her to do a whole lot more than what she's done. If we look at her lipids, she still has very abnormal lipids. She has high triglycerides. She has high LDL cholesterol. Her non-HDL is abnormal. Her fasting glucose is 100. Are you concerned about 100 fasting glucose? Or, okay. Guidelines say, you know, 100 is okay. Hemoglobin A1C of 5.7. Are we worried about that? Maybe? Okay, 5.7 to 6.4 is technically that pre-diabetic or at risk for diabetes zone as of last year's guidelines. Okay, so if we look, look at the American Heart Association guidelines for women, what they tell us to do is consider this woman at risk. She has two major risk factors. She is supposed to be now considered for lipid lowering therapy. Again, this is primary prevention. I wanna make sure that I'm treating the right people and not over-treating every, every young woman with a high lipid disorder. As you can see, when we did an NMR in her, she actually has significant risk. Her particles are 2,500, that's off the charts. And she's got a whole lot of small dense LDL. Her insulin resistance score is high. So she, she actually does have risk. This is somebody that if we were debating about whether we needed a drug, I think maybe we're feeling a little bit more confident that we should be doing something. The thing is, what are we gonna do? I can tell you everything on this list will improve her LDL particles. The question is how do we decide what we're gonna do? And there isn't a right or wrong answer here. I'm gonna show you what we did in two months with this woman. Something we did, some combination of things there, uh, lowered her particles for 1,000 points, dropped her small particles even more than that. So the question is what did we do? Anyone wanna guess? Metformin? Metformin. 1,500 milligrams, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients that respond like this. Thousand point drops. 
uh, especially if there's uh, lifestyle intervention also going on. In her case, she really didn't have a change because she was already at goal there. What I can tell you from clinical experience is if you use less than 1,500 milligrams, you're not going to get as much of a shift. You really need 1,500 to 2,000 to see the benefit. And again, that's just from my own clinical experience. Um, and I would use the long-acting once a day, uh, twice a day. Therapies uh, are never taken adequately. Uh, and then you run into trouble. So once a day, generic metformin ER is what we use. I have the patient self-titrate. I give them a prescription for 1,500 to 2,000. I tell them to take it, take one for a few days. If your stomach's not upset, go ahead and take two. By the end of the month, be on three or four. Uh, you tend to see weight loss with metformin very consistently. Uh, most patients will have a weight loss. Now, in her case, she really wasn't very overweight, so you're not going to see you know, a 20-pound drop, but she did have a little bit of a drop, which is not unexpected. If you look at her other labs, I just want to point a few things out. Triglycerides normalized, that's not unexpected. That's published effects of metformin. We know that it does that. HDL went up, that sometimes occurs. CRP normalized, her IR score normalized, and her LDL cholesterol didn't budge. Just want to show you that LDL cholesterol doesn't tell the story of the magic of treating insulin resistance in the same way that the particles do. All right, so it's not difficult to consider therapy like this. You lose weight, and this is what you tell the patient. You're going to lose weight. Your particles are going to go down. Your triglycerides may, may decrease. Your HDL can go up. By the way, it's been shown to prevent progression to diabetes. It has cardiovascular mortality benefit. It is safe to give pregnant women, and it's generic. It's not hard to sell this at all. Much harder to sell a statin. Side effects, issues, other things that we run into. All right. I'm talking fast. I'm trying to get through the slides. I hope I'm not speaking too quickly. They always say that in my evaluation, she talks too fast. I'm trying to get better, <laughs> uh, to take a beta block or something. All right, so, um, so this is a real guy. This is my patient. Um, and actually, I kind of feel like, man, we've not been on Oprah, and this man deserves to be, because I'm going to show you some things here. Anyway, 38-year-old gentleman with obesity, Family history of premature heart disease, he's really a ticking time bomb. He came to me a train wreck. Almost 400 pounds, blood pressure is elevated, glucose is abnormal, family history is awful. I'll show that here. Both sides of the family, diabetes, heart disease, everything. He used to smoke, although quit a number of years ago, thankfully. Um, he eats a typical American diet. He doesn't exercise. He's your average American guy. The only reason he's in my office is his wife wants to have kids, and she doesn't think her dad's, he's going to be around to see their you know, grade school graduation. So she's like, get him in, get him in shape. He happened to be you know, pretty motivated, too. We did an NMR on him initially. And not surprisingly, his LDL particles were elevated. So 1,900 optimals under 1,000. His LDL cholesterol is only 112. That doesn't really make us really get too worried. Uh, the particles may make us a little more concerned. He does have a low HDL. Not surprising with obesity. We certainly see that type of trend. Triglycerides were OK. Insulin resistance score uh, elevated again. Not surprising. He meets clinical criteria for metabolic syndrome. Another thing I want to point out with that is oftentimes people don't meet clinical criteria for metabolic syndrome. They have two out of the five markers. When your lipoproteins tell a different story, I feel justified to bring on therapy, even though technically they don't uh, have three out of the five criteria. OK, so the question is, what happened in six months to bring this guy's particles down almost 1,000 points, normalize his non-HDL, normalize his blood pressure, his Hemoglobin A1C went from 5 point, I believe it was 7 or 8, to 5.2. What do we think he did? I'm going to show you. Well, we got him to change his diet. My dietician took him to the grocery store and taught him how to shop the periphery. Stay away from the boxes. Shop the periphery, where the, where the fresh stuff is. And the gentleman went to a personal trainer and lost 133 pounds in six months. And you know what? He didn't get medication. It was my gut reaction to just give him drugs and say, well, stop the meds later. But he was so motivated, want to give it a chance. He, at this point, is on a little bit of metformin. Uh, with the, the diabetes in the family and the glucose abnormalities, I felt that was appropriate for him. But by no means did metformin cause this weight loss. This was his hard work. He deserves to be on Oprah, I think. <laughs> She's not around anymore doing her own shows. But So I just want to show you again. That was six months. This is a year. So he's really maintained, and he continues, continues to have progress. That's such a good success story. I mean, it makes me cry. I just He comes in, and he's just so proud of what he's been able to accomplish. And I'm so proud of him. I mean, he would have been on six or seven drugs to control all of those different problems that he had. And you know, if you can get somebody to do that and make a difference and change their life, it's so fixable. All right, That's another, that was primary prevention. Let's do another secondary prevention case here. 
This is a 58-year-old woman with a very strong family history of cardiovascular disease. She's always had a normal lipid panel. This is a woman with an HDL over 100. Now, after this conference, I'm sure many of you are wondering, and somebody with a family history with an HDL over 100, that very well may be a dysfunctional HDL, and I would certainly agree with you, but she went to see her primary care doctor over the years, and this is the panel she had, and she was always told, you know, maybe take an aspirin, keep eating right, but there's nothing I can do for you. And you didn't get the genes that are in your family. Obviously, your lipids uh, don't seem to reflect that. Well, she decided she wanted to do advanced testing and made appointment with us. And at the time, we had about a three-month waiting list. So on her way, waiting for the lipid clinic advanced panel, she ends up having uh, some chest pain. So she goes to the emergency room, and they give her Prilosec. They didn't do a cardiac workup, other than a lipid panel. They told her that because her HDL was so high, this was clearly not a cardiac issue, which is disturbing. Two weeks later, of course, she's still having chest pain. And now she comes to the ER again, and she gets herself an EKG, 70% uh, left main disease, and she ended up with triple vessel bypass surgery. So I guess she did get the gene. Uh, so her doctor put her on a torvastatin, you know, omega-3s, Plavix, everything that's certainly very appropriate. She now comes into the lipid clinic about a month after surgery. And this is her lipid panel on Lipitor 40, which is interesting. It almost looks a little bit worse. Uh, we did a little bit, we began to evaluate her. We see that now she has a high LP little a. Well, we know that's a marker. So there she's got a flag. There's something that's associated with premature heart disease. Um, we also want to rule out other things. Her thyroid was normal. Her CRP was very elevated, but I'm attributing that to post-surgery. Uh, obviously, it would need to be repeated. Uh, her L LP PLA2 is also elevated in the three to 400 range. So. Uh, ALT here is 80. How many of you stop drugs when you see uh, liver enzymes elevated in patients on statins? Just say no. Don't anyone raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Um, please don't do that. I mean, obviously, so much of the liver disease that's going on here is fatty liver disease from, you know, commonly from dyslipidemia or insulin resistance or something. And certainly, unless the liver enzymes are more than three times normal, there's absolutely no reason to stop the therapy. Even when they are three times normal, I would actually just check it again. And, and certainly work up other reasons for elevated liver enzymes. So, whoops, I gave you the answer. I was going to say, what do you think our particles are? And the thing is, with these particles, they're not naked. They're on a tour of a 40, big gun, right? So they're going to look better. This person needs particles under 700. They are 3,000. And every single one of them is small, okay? Now, what I want to say is I've been teaching you when you see small, dense LDL, you know, and that's associated with insulin resistance, we're reaching for, you know, other agents. When it comes to patients with secondary prevention, please make sure that you're using statins appropriately in, in secondary prevention as first line, even if insulin resistance is part of the story. If you're thinking about utilizing therapy for insulin resistance, make sure you're doing that uh, as additive to other, other agents like statins. That certainly would be appropriate in somebody like this, and she's already on it. So what we did with her is we switched her to Rosuva. Now, I, I believe when Dr. Rosen was talking about the non-blood-brain barrier statins, I think he was talking about hydrophilic statins, which would be Rosuvastatin, Pravastatin, and uh, Fluvastatin, which is Lescol. So those are hydrophilic. Uh, there is head-to-head -head data with NMR lipoprofiles, Lipitor, and, and uh, Crestor, and Crestor does do a little bit better job at dropping particles. In this case, that's actually all we did was we, we obviously advised her about her diet. We advised her to go on Rosuvastatin instead of the, the Lipitor, and she did have a significant drop. Now, I want to show you that she also ended up having a drop in her small particles, which I don't have up here. Um, but that didn't happen from a statin because statins don't do that. Statins don't shift particles. Any shift in particles size that occurred with her occurred because of her lifestyle efforts, not because of the drug therapy. Okay, so because of the fact she had a high LP little a and she still has a too high particle number for her disease, we added niacin. This is a six month and then we show a year later. So now she's on Rosuva, niacin, omega-3s, and these are her lipids. What's very interesting about this is they're no different than when she was on no drugs prior to surgery. Her lipid panel tells us nothing. Now, if you see this, you may be inclined to put her on another lipid drug because her LDL cholesterol is supposed to be under 70. Well, I don't really care about what her LDL cholesterol is. I want to know what her particles are. In her case, her LDL particles are 600 on combination drug therapy. Combination drug therapy in patients with very, very high risk uh, and advanced testing is what's needed, and that's what's going to fix the, the problem. Okay. I'm going to do, this is the last because I think I'm close to being on time, right? Okay. Uh, I woo, talk fast. This, this case, um, 
I wanted to do because I think it points out the importance of using our brain instead of just using our pen to prescribe more drugs. Because people who have significant dyslipidemia, when they come to you and they're on a lot of drugs, our inclination, when we see, for example, in this patient, a triglyceride level of 1,400, uh, panic attack, what am I going to do? I don't want to get pancreatitis. I, what other drug can I add? The patient is already on phenofibrate, colocevalam on well call, azetamide, nicotinic acid 500, a lot of blood pressure medications, and there's no statin here because of elevated liver enzymes in the past. No intolerance to statins, just a history of elevated liver enzymes. So you look at this, this is a guy with risk factors. He's got dyslipidemia, hypertension, he also has sleep apnea, and he's overweight. So his total cholesterol is 300, his HDL is 29, his triglycerides are off the charts. So again, our inclination is, what are we going to add? But I'd ask you, first of all, to think, what are you going to stop? Beer? Beer? Okay, so ask him about alcohol. Good. Well call, why? Okay, so well call is totally contraindicated in a person with triglycerides in that range. Well call is an awesome agent for lowering LDL particles. I use it all the time in statin intolerant people that I need to be using drug therapy in. But in somebody with a high triglyceride, it will raise triglycerides. It's absolutely inappropriate. So get that off the page. Um, hydrochlorothiazide may increase triglycerides some as well. Beta blockers increase triglycerides. You need to know this. Estrogen, depending on the formulation, may increase triglycerides if it's oral estrogen. Transdermal won't, but oral estrogen may. So if you've got a secondary reason, get rid of it and certainly talk about the diet and ask him what he's drinking and not just alcohol, but what calories do you drink? Don't let people drink sugar. Make sure that whatever they're consuming in the form of liquid is zero calorie beverages. That's huge. Uh, but other, obviously the guy has a genetic problem, right? I mean, because even if he's drinking a lot of sugar, his, you know, his triglycerides of 1,400. Now, I am maybe a little controversial about how I feel about this element, but if somebody's got a triglyceride of 1,400 and they're on phenofibrate, in my opinion, the phenofibrate isn't working for that patient. So there is the question of, do you stop it? Many people would be very uncomfortable with that because it's a triglyceride-lowering agent, but some patients respond great to fibrates and some don't. And if he's not responding, I don't know that it's needed. Uh, niacin at this dose will do very little for triglyceride reduction and probably not as much for LDL particle reduction either. So if you want to use niacin, which I certainly am, am an advocate of utilizing for par both particle reduction as well as trig reduction, you want to get to at least 1,000 to 1,500 if it's combination therapy. As monotherapy with niacin, 1,500 to 2,000 is probably what you're going to need. Okay, so uh, giving you a little bit more data now. His NMR showed particles of 1,600. And NMR is going to be accurate in the, in the setting of high triglycerides, whereas an LDL cholesterol will not be. His particles are also very high. Now, I presumed he was insulin resistant when I saw him. We didn't have the A1C on site, but obviously he's an undiagnosed diabetic. What is one of the most common secondary causes of dyslipidemia, especially high triglycerides, is undiagnosed diabetes. And again, when you, when you see young people that may have really awesome pancreases that are compensating for that glucose and have A1Cs of 5.2, 5.3, but high trigs, please look into insulin resistance. Either do an NMR and detect that, get an insulin level, do something to be able to sort that out. Because if you can treat the insulin resistance, you may be able to correct the problem without putting them on lipid-lowering therapy. So obviously he has a number of things here, also has elevated liver enzymes. Uh, now in that range, would that prevent you from using, from initiating a statin? He's not on a statin. Some people are uncomfortable, I'm not uncomfortable with liver enzyme elevations because when I treat people's lipids, the liver enzymes improve. I just follow them a little bit more closely. What we did with this gentleman, uh, and the only reason we actually did this all in one visit, which is unusual for me, uh, but I did it because he lived two or three hours away and I just wanted to get him quickly fixed. So we stopped Clocevalon, we stopped Phenofibrate, we actually stopped Zetia. I was just trying to eliminate medications. We added Resuva. I don't know what got into me that day. I would normally do 20, but some reason I put him on 40. With liver enzyme elevations, I'd usually do 20. Um, we also started him on prescription omega-3s, four grams a day, uh, and we started him on metformin and titrated that to 1,500. And you can see the results of his therapy in two months. Uh, things almost completely normalized. So bottom line is don't always just add more drugs when you see somebody with dyslipidemia. Really think about other secondary causes, ruling out root causes of the problem um, before you just add more drug to the mix because sometimes the best thing to do is actually take away therapy, start over. Okay. So uh, this is obviously, if we begin to eliminate 
these, these factors that we have control over, we're really on a better path to health. So I found this picture online last night. I was all excited. I was thinking if he was here, we'd show off Governor Thompson. It really was enjoyable to interact with him as well. So thank you very much. I hopefully didn't go too over.